primarily an agrarian type of society. Uh, agriculture was the main industry. 65% of all the people who lived here at that time were involved in agriculture. There were only seven provinces in Canada at that time. Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Newfoundland did not belong to the Confederation. Uh, Montreal was the largest city in the country. Uh, there were 1,733,000 married couples at that time, and only 600 of them, 600 of them were divorced. <laughs> <laughs> so the world has changed a little bit. And the average salary at the time was $26 per month. So that's the setting of the stage when we enter in 1880 Prince of Rhode Island. There are two are six people essentially involved in the story. Uh, we heard tell, everybody heard tell of the Klondike Gold Rush. Well, we had a Klondike Gold Rush in Prince of Rhode Island that started around 1900. Actually, the foundation was laid in 1890 and the Gold Rush started in 1910. In 18, uh, the persons who were involved, the two I'm going to talk about mostly is a guy by the name of Charles Dalton from Dignish and a guy from uh, named Robert Oden, who came from Little Shemogue, New Brunswick. Now, Charles Dalton was a farmer, and he was a druggist, and he was a woodsman, a hunter. And he had a bunch of friends that were also similar in traits, uh, farmers and hunters. One of them was Robert Oden. Anyway, Charles Dalton, over his years as a, a trapper, he would once in a while have the occasion to trap a silver fox. Now a silver fox is a mutation of a red. Okay, Most of your foxes are red foxes, but every once in a while, every so many thousands are born, there's a mutation shows up that had a silver. It was actually quite black at the time. So anyway, when he shipped those pelts that were called uh, silvers to the London Fur Exchange, they fetched quite large prices. Remember I said uh, the average person was making about $1,000 a year. Uh, he would send a silver felt, fox pelt to London Fur Exchange and he'd get $1,000 for the pelt. So he knew that there was, if he could just come up with a way of capturing these animals and breeding them in captivity, that there was money to be made. So to that end, he started off looking for live pups. He found two in a place called, it's now called a Fox Hill, up by North Cape. And there was a guy by the name of uh, uh, Benjamin uh, Livingston, and he took out those two pups, and he went to Charles Dalton's barn, and they set up some pens, and they tried to ranch them. This was around 1870, but they didn't have any success. Uh, there was, however, a couple of black pups that were dug out of a uh, den down in the deck. And uh, the person who dug those out sold them. And I should say, the first two pups that came out of Fox Hill were, one was uh, purchased for a cow, <laughs> and the other was purchased for $25. Uh, then the next two pups that came out, this year was around 1883, and uh, they came from lot 40, there was two black pups dug out, and he paid $300 for the pair, and he took them home, and Charles Dalton was successful on two separate years in getting pups from those uh, animals. So he knew that it can be done, however they stopped breeding, and he knew that he wasn't doing things just right. This is when Robert Olton came into the picture. Robert Olton was a very kind, gentle, quiet, easygoing man. And he had the temperament to basically take these animals which were wild and do whatever you could to raise them. So to this end, Charles Dalton and Robert Olton, in secret, purchased Cherry Island off of Alberton and went about setting up a fox ranch. And the fox ranches at that time, they would have a pen, and the pen probably was lar as large as this hall. Because that's what they thought. You had to mimic, you had to imitate the wild in order to be successful in raising them. 
And the first dens, which is the nest where the uh, foxes have their pups, were made to look like, like holes in the ground where traditionally they would have their pups. And they did this in secret, and they didn't tell anybody what was going on, and they were successful. Robert Olton successfully put together the ranching of silver foxes. Uh, they didn't tell anybody what they were doing. They would ship their foxes to the London Fur Exchange, and how word got out that there was a lot of money being made there was uh, when it came, the money would come in the form of checks to the bank in Auburn. And the people who worked there as tellers were telling people, you know, these guys, here's what's going on. So, uh, that was the first ranch, and that was around 1890. Then uh, Robert Olton and Charles Dalton had a friend, and his name was Robert Tuplin. And Robert Tuplin had another woodsman friend by the name of Captain James Gordon. And they formed the second ranch. And it, it's strange because it was uh, Charles Dalton and Robert Olton that furnished the first pair of breeding stock for Robert Tuplin and James Tuplin, or James Gordon, to take down, again to try to mimic nature, they took them to Black's Banks, off of Freeland at the end of the Murray Road which was as far away as you could get from anybody else. And they set up a quiet little ranch there, and they started the second ranch. And the third one was one that actually came about as a result of experimentation done independently of anything that Robert Olton or Charles Dalton did. And it was B.I. Rayner and Silas Rayner from up in Castenbeck. They were experimenting at the same time and almost simultaneously were raising silver foxes. So those were the six characters, if you would, that came into being. They started ranching silver foxes around 1890. Uh, they kept it uh, secret and kept it in control in a monopoly situation for as long as they could. And they did this by forming what they call the Big Six Combine. And the Big Six Combine was an agreement that was made between those six individuals that the only animals that would leave their ranches would be dead and cattle. There would be no livestock sold to anyone under any circumstances. So between 1890 and 1910, that's exactly what happened. They made a lot of money, I mean, uh, and they started to develop strains of foxes, and uh, people began to know what was going on, and got inquisitive, and got anxious to own, etc. Uh, there was uh, the Big Six Combine, one of the members, I think it was the Tuplins, that broke the agreement. And they sold a pair of silver foxes to a nephew, Frank Tuplin. And Frank Tuplin uh, became a character in his own right. But uh, anyway, when the Big Six Combine uh, was broken, then uh, everybody felt, well, this guy's doing it, I'll do it. This is where really big money's made. So all of a sudden, overnight, the Klondike Gold Rush and PDI started. Mm -hmm. I call it that because it's similar to that. Everybody wanted in. Uh, companies were formed overnight and capitalized, and large amounts of money went in. Uh, Charles Dalton sold his ranch for a half a million dollars in cash. Uh, the people who were in possession of foxes at that time, you could get as high as $35,000 for a pair of foxes. So that's, that's a lot of money. So the boom was on, and that's the founding of the silver fox industry, and then there were some great notable characters that come out of that. Uh, the home and house in Charlottetown, which was one of the more notable houses in Prince Edward Island at that time in history, was traded for one pair of silver foxes. Uh, uh, another guy that I'll relate to you because it's in this area in north in Prince Edward Island was uh, the first, probably one of the first instances of where you had a franchise situation occur. Because uh, the, there was a guy, he came from Freeland, his name was Tom Milligan. He went through the Klondike Gold Rush to pan for gold and he had a strike along the Klondike River. Uh, he and his son Edgar ended up going up there. And while they were up there, uh, Tom took 
cancer. This is just one of the many, many stories that can go with the box industry. Edgar brought Tom back to Prince Edward Island because he was dying. And when he was home with his father, he found out what was going on in the fox industry. Holy smokes, look at what was going on. The silver fox was being raised. This is the kind of money they're being made. So he knew something that nobody else knew, that Prince Edward Island isn't the only place that could silver foxes. There's silver foxes in Alaska. So he went back to the Klondike Gold Rush. He sold his claim, I think it was $8,300 he got for it. And he showed snowshoe personally 500 miles into the interior of Alaska to a place called the Tanana Valley. And this is some of the strange things that will happen in history. There was a, a guy from Seattle, Washington that was running a fur trading post at that time. And his name was uh, George Morrison. And uh, he had silver foxes in pens which he had raised. He had traded with uh, the local natives uh, and, and he actually was raising silver foxes. But he didn't know, one, that they were doing this in Prince of Dion, and he didn't know how much you could get for a pair of breeding foxes in Prince of Dion. So he and uh, Edgar Milligan sat down. They talked about what the opportunity looked like. They formed a partnership and uh, it became the Millican and Morrison Fox Ranch. They bought two 50-acre parcels of land on the north side of the Northern Road, which became the Home Ranch. Before they were done, uh, they did a lot of things. Uh, one, they had the franchise for Farina Chows for the Northwest Territories and all of Atlantic Canada. They had one of the first, steam, first purebred Holstein Frisian cattle herds on Prince Edward Island. They had the opening of the barn at that time was the largest gathering of islanders on Prince Edward Island with the exception of Old Home Week. They uh, put together a franchise system and the franchise system spanned 32 states in the U.S. with 35 ranches. And they had the largest settlement of silver foxes ever assembled and it left Summerside on freight trains and uh, it was worth $844,000. And uh, these guys, they were both killed on the same night uh, in uh, Buffalo, New York, in a car accident. But anyway, that's where the silver fox industry started. Simultaneously also, anything that had fur on it, uh, they tried to rent, ranch. Uh, they skinned cats. <laughs> they uh, brought skunks here. Skunks weren't native to PEI. They brought them here for fur. But now they're they've established. Uh, the uh, meat industry of the world, it, they not only pioneered silver fox ranching and rock fox ranching in a domesticated uh, scene, they also did that for the mink uh, ranching. So mink ranching, it, as it exists in the world today, started on Prince of Rhyme. Uh I'm not going to drag it on. There's a whole lot of things that you can say about the silver fox industry and the characters that were in it. But, Suffice to say, a lot of money was made. It, it helped a lot of farmers through the hungry 30s, having some foxes on their farm. Uh, and most of the fortunes were made at the front end, but with a few exceptions. There were some people that made some money later on, not by ranching silver, but by capitalizing on mutations. The Millington Morrison Fox Ranch was not what we call an eastern silver. Milligan Moores and Fox Ranch was an Alaskan silver, which when you brought it home to PEI and you bred it to an Eastern silver, you got a different colored fox. It was a natural breeding mutation and therefore commanded a premium price. Uh, when you go through Salisbury, New Brunswick, on your way up to Fredericton, you'll go into the big stop uh, garage there, and you will see a picture of Fred Colpitz. Fred Colpitz uh, was a guy from uh, Salisbury, come over here, bought a couple of foxes, established a sizable ranch in Salisbury, New Brunswick. He noticed a couple of strange looking pups in one of the litters uh, in the years that ensued. And uh, he never told anybody again, secrecy was always kind of a thing that went with fox ranching. And he took those uh, two pups and he 
ranch them separately, and they became uh, a natural breeding uh, mutation. They became your platinum foxes. Then there was ring neck foxes, and there was all kinds of different strains. So people who developed those strains for some period of time made a lot of money because it kind of started a, a mini a gold rush again, if you would. And, uh, but anyway, that's how the whole industry started. I started off talking about Charles Dalton and Robert Alton. That's where I'm going to end up. Charles Dalton was uh, a guy who, he was the public relations person. He was the front man. He was the guy that put the business deals together. And Robert Alton was a quiet gentleman in back. Robert, uh, Charles Dalton did a lot of things for Prince Edward Island. He uh, built the orphanage for our province. He uh, built Dalton Hall for the University of St. Dunstan's at the time. He built the Dalton Elementary School in Tignish. And he did a lot of, of things like that. And uh, uh, in recognition of that, uh, he became a member of the legislature. 